Welcome to this week's episode of the JJ Reddick Podcast with Tommy Alter. This week, we are joined by two media superstars, Ryan Russillo from the Ringer Network and Big Cat from Barstool. Gentlemen, welcome. Good to see you. Very excited. It's great to be here. Great to be here. I can tell. Uh, a lot of people don't know this about Big Cat and I, but we are actually neighbors, soon to be even closer. Closer. We live in the same neighborhood in Dumbo. Not in height, though. Uh, no, I'll be higher than you. But yeah, we do, wow. and it's uh, no one's no one's in Dumbo right now. It's a ghost town, which so. is crazy because it's a tourist central. You and I ran into each other like three three years ago, actually. Mm-hmm. I think I was taking a, a walk with my youngest, who is not even one yet. Had a dip in my mouth, I think, mm-hmm. and you caught me. And do you remember the rest of that story? Because you probably don't want to tell that part, but you were, we were, we were standing there talking, catching up. And then a guy ran by and was like, yo, big cat, what's up? And I was like, Hey, what's up, man? And then he like paused for a second. I was like, is JJ Reddick here? He's like, Oh, what's up, JJ? So, um, that's, big cats, there. that's his favorite thing to do ever. He did, he did it. He loves it. He loves it. So. Oh, well, it's just the idea that anyone would stop me when I'm standing next to JJ Reddick. And maybe it's a, maybe it's a, uh, like age thing, but like JJ Reddick is a name oh, that but, will forever live in my brain. But that's happening to you guys a lot. Now we were with you in new Orleans, uh, uh, after the national championship game that night and you and PFT were getting stopped everywhere. We were, we were with like Anthony Rizzo. We were with like people. Yeah. We were with like the World Series MVP, and no one gave a shit, and they only cared about you two and Hank. Yeah, and Hank. You got to always remember Hank. But that feels like it was uh, ten years ago because we haven't been able to be outside at a bar, do anything for forever now. When did that start? It really, it really is depressing. All right, this so you guys, week. you guys have yeah. you guys have your own podcast, obviously. So all your listeners know how you're doing. But for my listeners, talk to me about your your isolation and your quarantine right now. How's it going? Uh, so you go start. first. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my friends have joked that that this isn't really that much of a daily routine change up for me. So um, yesterday, I moved out all my furniture. I'm building a rack in my living room, and uh, I'm just trying to figure out some way to to stay stay on top of things. I rode a bike the other day for the first time in like ten years. I can't I can't get off of that thing. I've ordered reflectors and stuff off of Amazon, so I'm excited to really pimp that thing out. Um, and you know, look, the podcast part of it, we're lucky that people still want them. So I really don't have anything to complain about, and I'm just uh, I'm just hanging out, man. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I feel like the quarantine is is two different worlds. It's for the people with with children and the people without children. The people without children can kind of like go back to basically living in college, and uh, the people with children, it's like this get me out of here. This, uh, just trapped in, in an apartment in New York city kind of sucks. I wish I had a backyard. Uh, but I I'm making do I bought, um, I bought a, you're buying a lot uh, of stuff, 80 pound vest <laughs> that I walk around the neighborhood and I bought a trumpet, <laughs> which my neighbor is not happy about. So that that's going to be an ongoing thing. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good tone, right? It's great. So I just keep buying random stuff and filling my apartment with more and more junk. And uh, yeah, it's it sucks right now, but it's uh, important that everyone stays home. I feel like you got to say that, you know, because we yeah. are influencers. So stay at home, guys. I was talking to one of our assistant coaches with the Pelicans uh, last night, and we were going through the pleasantries of how are you doing? And he said to me, I've been training for this my whole life. I love isolation. I can see why this would be so bad for you because you're a people person. You know, I like to be out, man. I like to be out. I like to be interacting with people. I mean, this, this is like hot. This sucks for me. This sucks. I'm it, the, every day that goes by, I'm getting a little worse, a little worse. A, a part of my soul is dying. I shouldn't use I, that word. I, I, I really that out. What's happening here is, is that once we get through day 30, because I've tried to, I don't know, we get a lot of time on our hands. I spend a lot of time theorizing, but are people going to start really losing it after day 30? Or like a lot of people, once it's kind of day 30 and you've accepted it as your new normal, 
are people going to be better off mentally? I'm going with the positive one on the ladder there because I think that's how things work. But And that's so. when the government comes and padlocks our doors and they're <laughs> like, guess what? You're trapped inside forever now. You're all robots and we've uh, enslaved the entire world. That's what that's what I think is going to happen, Russell. But the I always think about like what's going on right now. And I agree with you, JJ. You don't realize how much like just human interaction day to day you take it for granted. Uh, I'm just thinking about the people who love to be like, I'm an introvert extrovert. And like those frauds that like, you know, say, Oh, I just like to sit on my couch on the weekend and just kind of I'm a nerd. You know, unwind and be away from the world. Those people are being exposed as frauds right now. Cause they're probably like, man, I really wish I could go outside and like talk to a person. Tommy, do you have anything to add to this? <laughs> What's the worst thing you guys have watched in the last week? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you last night. Who watches the no, social was, network twice? Dude. Who watches it back to back? Did you, did you miss an ending? Uh, okay, I'm going to walk you through my night very briefly. It's a great night. movie, by the way, but twice? There's very efficient marijuana gummy delivery service in Los Angeles. I was really hungry. I, had, I ordered a burrito. I've been cooking, by the way. I've been, I've been cooking most meals. I got some gummies. I made some cookies. I watched the social network. I forgot how good it was. And so I started watching it again. I didn't get through the, I didn't get through the whole thing twice, but I watched about the full, full movie and then the start of the movie again, uh, probably another half hour in and then that was it. Wait, so you're saying you watched it and you're like, oh, fuck, man, let's run it back. Dude. Yeah. The music in the movie is so good. It's the best music in any movie. I think it's the best movie ever made, personally. What? what? I think Wait, it's, the, it's <laughs> really... I think it's, it's really best, good. I think it's the what? best movie. I think it's the best movie ever made in the history of cinema. How good were these gummies? Are you still high? <laughs> I mean, they were good, but I, I, I have thought this for a while. You don't think that you don't think the social network is up there for best movies ever made? Uh, no, I don't, not even close. Whoa. Okay. I'll say this. It is. The, oh, oh, Ryan just got triggered. The, so, <laughs> this, it, is the, it is the citizen Kane of the 21st century. The opening dialogue, okay. that opening scene where Zuckerberg's talking to the girl that's not interested in him and they're having two separate conversations while they're having the same conversation. As a writer, you know, I don't know if you, there's certain things you guys probably can't pick up on, but mm -hmm. I did. <laughs> I, I, it's a good movie. I just, I, I don't know if I'd watch it back to back twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that I would agree with. Yeah. You, you want me to chime in on the social network? So I'm going to back up Tommy here and just say, that I, I get what he's saying. So he, he's a little stoned. He kind of loses interest because he's enjoying his high. He gets about three quarters of the way through the movie. He picks up on a scene. He's like, holy shit, this movie's actually really good. He starts the movie over, rewatches it. And now he's in that space where he can really focus and he enjoys the movie. Is that essentially what you're saying? Yes. I would have never been high. I I've asleep. never been high before. So I don't, I I'm just, I would have made it through twice. I'm guessing at what it's it. like. Yes. Yeah. Right. So yeah, but then, you, then the next day, you. the next day you ranked it the number one movie in the history of the world, though. That's oh, where you yeah, get a little I pushback. Stand, I, I stand by that. What, Rusilla? What is what is the number one movie in the history of the world to you? Uh, I, I, look, sometimes mm. everybody mm. rowing in the same direction. They're right. I just think those first two Godfathers are tough, tough to beat. I don't mm -hmm. really know what else is up there. Um, you know, I know this is going to sound really funny and old fashioned, but as far as like the storytelling and even though it takes forever, but Gone with the Wind is an incredible movie. Um, and if we're going to go something that's not as artsy, I think Rushmore actually is like a perfect movie. I love Rushmore. Rushmore is like a great it, movie. But I don't know Rushmore that anybody's going to say movie. it. Yeah, I mean, it would take a lot of gummies for me to come on the pod and say, I think it's number one in the world. But uh, do, I don't know, what do else? you love all of Wes Anderson's movies? Bottle Rocket, I actually like better than Rushmore. Um, I love Tenenbaums. I love Rushmore. And then, you know, it, it took a real Wes Anderson fan to come out of some of the other ones and go, these are still some of the greatest movies ever. Um, he kind of started fair. feeling himself. You know what I mean? He kind of was like, oh, this is cool. Like, people like me getting even weirder and weirder. And I agree with you. Right after The Life Aquatic was like, Steve okay. You say no, after yeah. The Life Aquatic. Because The Life Aquatic, I, for me, is a classic. I, I like, I it's, like in my, it's in my top three Wes Anderson movies. I liked it, but it wasn't, it felt like it was trying to recapture what Rushmore and Tenon Bombs and Bottle Rocket were. And it kind of lost a little bit for, for me. Bottle, Bottle Rocket was something I saw in college. I just remember being like, okay, I might want to do this. Like this blows my mind how funny 
and it wasn't trying to be funny. He just wrote these these awesome characters. But so wait a minute, you have Zisu and it's in the top three. Then what do you have out between Tenenbaum's Rushmore and Bottle Rocket? Unless you have a completely different ranking for West JJ. I oddly have not seen Rushmore, and I and I hate to say that. What? Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah. You I think time. I've seen every one of his other movies, but I was put That's Tenenbaum's. Good. Was the first rush or uh, first Wes Anderson movie I saw? I saw that in college, right around that time. I saw Bottle Rocket, Zisu. I saw in theaters, and I enjoyed the Grand Budapest Hotel. Some people love that movie. I didn't enjoy it as much, so I'll, I'll reserve the third spot in my top three for Rushmore, even though I haven't seen it. All right, so Big Cat, what is what is your greatest movie of all time? Probably not um, your favorite, but the yeah, greatest. Probably Hard Target, Jean Claude Van Damme, Chance Boudreau. <laughs> Cajun, the Cajun flair for it. Uh, I don't know. I'm not like a huge. I don't time have cop very was good. Sh- <laughs> I was no, gonna say best of the best good. too. Yeah, yeah. Time no, cop, t- time cop holds up. A lot Cobra, of time travel movies do. Um, I'm not a huge. I love movies, but I'm not a huge, uh, strong opinions about movies guy. So I would probably go with what Ryan's saying. Like it's hard to beat Godfather. I I, I personally like Godfather two more than one, but it's hard to go against those movies um trying to think what else i actually had an idea i've been we've been rewatching movies on my radio show the yak little plug there for rosillo um exactly. we've been rewatching old sports movies and i've i've thought uh an idea is we need to start doing frankenstein movies so we're rewatching hoosiers and what if uh, what if uh, dennis hopper had a bomb like underneath the the basketball court and like, if Jimmy doesn't score sixty, like the place blows up. That's where I'm at for quarantine. It would just, make, just find these movies. It would make yeah, Hoosiers yeah, a lot better. That is amazing. It, it's, it, it would make Hoosiers a lot better. It would make Hoosiers like Castaway, Tom Hanks, Plane Island. He's deserted. Oh yeah, and there's also three hundred Nazis on the on the island that he has to kill before he can get off. I think Same in one of our Ryan. first, I went in one of our first power rankings. I had Hoosiers in my top five as one of my favorite bad movies. And I, I actually think Hoosiers is a bad movie. Really? It's a, oh, it's terrible. And let me Why? tell you my reasoning. So in any, given ge- in any <laughs> given game that they play, they'll show, let's say, 15 to 20 basketball clips. And if you really watch the movie closely, which I saw this movie probably two dozen times as a kid. But then as an adult, when I rewatched it, I realized it was the same three shots just from Mm -hmm. different angles. So Jimmy in the championship game is scoring the same basket in the first and the second half. They're just showing it from a different angle. And once I realized that the movie was ruined for me, but I still love it. It's still, it just, it's a bad movie. It's a bad movie. I I know what you're saying. You can't recut the championship game scenes. I know what you're saying thing because I, I literally just finished watching it uh an hour ago and in the championship game i was laughing because the last possession they're playing one-on-one defense against jimmy which would never happen and the defender is 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 forcing jimmy right and he's a righty and jimmy yeah. doesn't even cross him up he just gets a shot up it was that that part like as as a, as a kind of you know a scout uh, that I consider myself for basketball, I, I had a problem with that. That's how they played defense back then. Yeah. <laughs> have you ever watched? Have you seriously ever watched? Have you ever watched old old tape from like the sixties? They're hilarious. It's, yeah, it's, it's different. I mean, oh, the game evolves and stuff, but it's. I think Austin Rivers came out a few years ago and said that he would destroy Bob Cousy or something like that. I can't remember the exact words. I'm sure that went over. But well. I got I got to say, the average player in the NBA right now. Every one of them is a Hall of Famer. Is a fucking yeah, I th- Hall of I thought, Famer. If I've they argued in the this. 60s. Van Pell and I have argued this. If Eddie House played in the '60s, Eddie House, we'd have statues of the guy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I agree. I was, I was yeah. saying while I was watching Hoosiers, I was like, if Steph Curry, if you just put Steph Curry in 1951 Indiana and he was jacking up shots, do you think they would burn him as a witch? Yes, of course. <laughs> like, how is this guy? Like, this guy can't. This cannot be real. Yeah, that's why whenever I watch some of these older games, and, and JJ, this is what I always think is funny, and I've been over this, but just that every other athlete's evolve faster, stronger, skateboard tricks, 
just, hey, watch some Warren Miller videos and see what guys are even trying. But somehow basketball players are the only group of athletes to get worse, according to previous generations. And it's just laughable. Like I was going back watching the 90s Bulls stuff. Um, I watched the Sun series in 93. I watched the playoff series where Jordan lost. And then the next couple where he won. And I just go, look, I understand it's more physical and all these things. But where guys would be pulling up from, the shot attempt, the difficult shots that guys take that are actually decent shots now, guys would just from the 90s team would look around going, what the hell are they doing? Why are they keep doing this? And it's going in all the time. I'm not saying necessarily that like Steph would would score 50. And it's just it's just so silly and honestly disappointing when previous generations can't see how special you guys are now. Yeah. I, I, I've talked, I think I talked about this. I can't remember which episode it was, but I, I went on this kick for like two weeks where I was rewatching uh, Jordan highlights and the defensive scheming back then in the nineties was so bad. It was so bad. Even though, like the night you said the 93 series against the Phoenix suns, like I could, it, the, the, the level of rim protection in that series from Phoenix was just laughable. And this, and even with just terrible spacing on the bulls part, it actually doesn't yeah, see, make the, it, the spacing it doesn't make sense part now. of it. It's hilarious because now you need like all five guys to be able to threaten to get a bucket, maybe four. You know, that was one of the things that I really liked about Toronto's team is that every single guy they put in their rotation, you go, you know what? Like every one of these guys, like if Norman Powell, you know, has the ball with seven seconds left, like he'd probably get a nice shot off. And whenever I look at some of that other stuff, yes, people hit people harder at the rim, but the right. concepts, some of the switching, like I remember the, one of the first times like an NBA coach that I would talk to was like, okay, this is why you're an idiot. Um, which happened a lot in the beginning, but like you guys, when you switch, you don't ever really try to recover on your original assignment. You know, so if you get caught in a switch and a bad size matchup, idiots at home can be like, well, wait a minute. Well, you know, the ball is, is away. Why, why, why doesn't JJ run back to the guard and then switch with the big? If you guys try to do that, you get burned. Like you can't really do it unless you're so far away from the ball side and back then when I'm going through it, like Jordan would get switched and then Jordan would just go back to the guy that he wanted anyway. Not that Jordan was an amazing defender, but they're just right. little concept things that you're right, that you're pointing out that I watch and go, there's so many of these things that people don't even do anymore because they're just bad concepts. Yeah. I mean, part of the thing with sw switching and then getting back to your original matchup is people are too far away now. Exactly. So it's too much gonna, space. It's like you're, you're, you're basically inviting playing in rotation and playing in rotation in today's NBA is the one thing you don't want to do. It's the hardest, it's the hardest thing to guard is once you get scrambling, it's impossible. This is what it makes Toronto so crazy to me. And they did it last year. And I obviously we, we played them seven games, in the playoffs, but they do that better than any team I've ever seen ever. Um, it's like there's, Telep telepathy and they know where each guy is going to be at all times because it is random like rotations you're not getting like swing swing every single time one guy may fake a pass and drive and it's just like there's a guy there there's a body there at all times with them it's 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 actually remarkable so you're saying toronto just to kind of make sure everybody follow because i want to make sure i follow you're saying toronto plays defensively in rotation defensively where they're still yeah. challenging shots and getting out to contest in ways other teams don't. Because I constantly hear that Nick Nurse is, is like, other teams watch Nick Nurse and stuff he's doing and go, this guy's awesome. And so yeah. just to hear you reinforce that, I just want to make yeah, sure no, I understood I, it. So, so, so one of the things that, that, that happens in rotation, let's say you're in a scramble, you take a low man on a, the low man pulls over on a pick and roll to protect the rim. They swing to the opposite side. You've got a 15 foot close out on a 40% three point shoot in the corner. You have no chance of staying in front of the ball. Your literally your job is to run that guy off the line. Most teams, when you do that, if he takes a dribble inside the arc or tries to drive, or even takes a sidestep three, he's going to get a good look with Toronto. There's just always another body coming. They just, they're sending bodies to the ball in waves. And you know, if you don't have, five spacers out there. It makes it even more difficult at times to score. JJ, this might be a dumb question if we're talking about defense, but how much during a game do you count how many times you've been scored on? Cause like when I'm playing pickup, not to say that I'm an athlete, but yeah. I'm always like, if my guy doesn't score, then no one can blame me for the loss here. Yeah. The NBA doesn't work like that. 
because you're <laughs> you're constantly playing and help side. If we just play, if we just let the guy with the ball do his thing, you would never get a stop. I mean, guys are too skilled now. So yeah, you're 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 thinking about what what your job is on every play, meaning. Am I supposed to be at the nail to help on whoever's guarding Kawhi Leonard? And then my job is to run that. If he kicks it out, my job is to run that guy off the line and try to stay in front as best as possible. Um, I do count though, for sure. Yeah. You know, if you feel like I, I, it's not just, I don't count. I, I count when I get scored on, but I also count like mistakes and I try to limit those mistakes. Like if I am supposed to be the low man, or if there's a scouting report thing that if you close on this guy, you force him left and I, and I fuck that up like i that sits with me for multiple plays like it, it, you know multiple trips up and down the court it's in the back of my head like fuck man i'm pissed okay so off of that how many how many my bads can you do to your teammates before they're like <laughs> come on dude like how like is it three two because like, you know three is the, the, yeah, the fucking three is like dude shut up you stink tonight go sit on the bench stan stan used to always say that He's like, I'm so fucking sick of the my bads. <laughs> if we play one half and eight guys all have one my bad, that's eight fucking my bads. No more my bads. I love it though. Because no. I love when someone gets like absolutely destroyed and they're like, yep, yeah. that was my bad. Yeah. It's like, it's, yeah. it's, no, we know it was. I like the ones, I like the one where, like, and I, I'm guilty of this, so I'll be honest with you. So if it's like a marginal foul, you're probably going to have some sort of expression where you disagree with the referee. Maybe you're not going after the referee, but uh, you know, you give him the side eye or whatever. I like the, though, when a guy like blatantly gets hacked and the guy raises his hand, like yes. that's fouls on me. <laughs> well, yeah, no shit. You clotheslined him. <laughs> I've always noticed that like the alpha on a college team, especially if he's the guard and has the ball all the time, like, he'll throw some horseshit past the baseline on a guy and like he wasn't supposed to cut. Like you're supposed to stay nailed down on the corner, and it's just a horrible decision by the ball hand. And the guy will be like looking at him, and he's doing the "I got you," but he's he's pointing at himself, but he's pointing at him. And what he's really saying is, "I'm blaming you, but I'm yeah. pretending I'm such a leader yeah. that it's on me." But it, I'm letting you know that it's on you. But it, this looks yeah. better. It's the NBA same page, do that the too. same page NBA thing, where you're basically saying, too. "No, you got to get on my page." Right. Yeah. Uh, John Lucas was big on that big cat. John yes. Lucas, when he was with the Bulls, was like, hey. And then one of my favorite memes ever is when Derrick Rose went down again and the meme comes out and it's Lucas dribbling with his hand up. It's like, I fucking got this. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone step aside. Oh, man. I love this little stuff, though. I could do I this all day. About this. Yeah. yeah. The little stuff uh, on the court when you're uh, the my bads, the handshakes. What's, what's the, like the one the thing as a, as, a, as a fan watching the game, NBA specifically, like what's the one thing that NBA players do in a game that just drives you fucking crazy? Mm. Anything mm. Kyle Lowry does? <laughs> Anything Kyle Lowry does. <laughs> well, uh, I'm not you familiar know with, this, uh, with this hate for Kyle Lowry. What's, what's, no, what's wrong I, with I Kyle? respect Kyle, Kyle Lowry because I actually always liked him and was, was surprised he was bouncing around a little bit. But even he admitted, you know, but it's just um, the flopping thing towards towards the last couple of years has is, is been a, a real talking point for me. Um, it's just, you know what I, I think is funny when you go back and watch, if you do go back and watch some more of those old games, JJ, none of the guys complained. Like, and if they did complain, if Jordan complained or like when Barkley complained, Barkley looked, be like, where's the foul? The guy'd be like, Hey, I missed it or shut up. And then it was just, all right, on to the next one. Yeah. And now every single guy that gets minutes thinks he's, he's allowed mm. five minutes with the ref. And I know the league tried to, I think mm. you were, you were, you might have just been coming in the league when the league tried yeah. to do that thing in the beginning where they were calling everybody for technicals to try to get everybody to yep. stop complaining. I was in the league. Yeah. Right. And it it lasted like 30 days and all the players got really mad about it. And I understand it. But if you go back and watch, the lack of complaining really stands out and it's kind of easier. But I also understand, like, as a competitor, hell, I'll stare down a guy in a pickup game for like three possessions if he didn't call a foul when it's call your own. That's what an mm -hmm. asshole I am. So, you know, I, <laughs> I, I also think part, part I play of that too, JJ. Part of that, Ryan, is the um, the old head referees. They had a different way of dealing with you, and I always found you know a lot of these guys now are are retired, but I always found that I could 
talk to them and they would talk to me in a different way. And so like Monty McCutcheon, who's retired now, he talks about this all the time. He meets with every team once a year. And like, that's part of the training great. that referees Monty's have great. now. It's not right. just like you blew this call, you got this call, right? It's, uh, we're going to show you tape of this interaction with the player. Here's what you can do differently. And we're, we're coached up a little bit too, at times, like, you know, here's what you can do. I have a great, like Bennett Salvatore story. This might've been either the year, his last year or the, his second to last year, but we were playing in the 09 Eastern conference semifinals against the Celtics. We go to Boston, we win game one, game two, Eddie house goes berserk. We're getting blown out. And I fouled out at the end of the game and I walked over to Bennett and I said, I was like motioned to, him. I was like, Bennett, Hey, come here for a second. And I put my arm around him and then I whispered into his ear, fuck you guys. <laughs> <laughs> and then I started to walk back to the bench. And by the time I made it back to the bench, I hadn't heard a whistle. So I'm like, Oh, this is great. This is great. And then I turned around to look at him and he had dropped his whistle on the floor. So as soon as he could put it back in his mouth, he tossed me out of the, the fucking arena, <laughs> tossed me out of the game. And, he, and, and to this day, every, every single time he sees me, he goes, fuck you guys. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. My answer for the question of, uh, uh, things that drive me crazy is probably the the guys who uh, are always looking for that contact in the air, which I know is if you can get someone in the air and you can actually get them to foul you, but it's become a thing where a lot of times guys aren't even trying to shoot. Mm. They're literally just trying to get fouled and it drives me nuts. I used to get so mad when Miritich would do it with the Bulls and he would be like, if you just focused on trying to score here, you probably would get an and one instead. It's a lot of times like getting a guy half in the air and then jumping into him, And it like, I just hate that play. I'm, I'm probably somewhat guilty of that. Oh, de definitely. Everyone does it. Everyone does it. But if you have a good shot fake, especially at the end of a dribble where if there's under five seconds on the shot clock or at the end of a quarter, as a defender, you're thinking, I'm just going to jump and contest this guy's shot. He has to shoot. He's running out of time. And that's really where you can get guys. Um, Tommy, what's your most annoying thing? You've been awkwardly silent over there, by the way. What's your most I'm, annoying I'm thing in watching, in watching NBA, an NBA game Social that NBA players on. do? At the game? Oh, you, you've got something off the court then. Hold on. Rachel, you go. I need to think about this for a second. I have a question for you, though. Oh, he said his. He said the flopping. He hates I, have a, the flopping. I have a question I've for you. About, I have a question for you about about working the refs. Like, how long do they have to be in the league before the ref starts to respect them? Hmm. I actually think our refs have like the hardest job in the world. And for the most part, they're all pretty dang good. And I don't think there's as much like this. I'm not going to make a call here because this guy's a rookie. Now there's, I think if you if you learn to interact with them early on in your career in like a positive way and you get to know their names and you, know, you come out for warm ups and you remember things about them, like, they're humans. We're humans. Like there, there's human interaction like that to me is where you gain a level of respect. And I've seen young guys like just intuitively know how to do that right away. Um, and then I've seen young guys who don't know how to like have those interpersonal skills and you know, they'll come back to the bench shaking their head. Like I'm not getting these calls cause I'm a rookie or whatever. And you're just like, no, it's, that's literally not it. it. You, you didn't get fouled there. So it's, it's a college call. There is a yeah. jump too, from what, get, what, what gets called in college and what get, what's get, gets called in the NBA. I would just love for you, I would have a hard time if, if I were a pro athlete not fucking with the media more. And I know there's no way you can win and almost no one would ever get it. But I do think it would be hysterical like towards the end of your career after a loss that doesn't even mean anything where they'd say, you know, hey, what went wrong tonight, JJ? And you're guarding like a kid that was called up from the G League 
and you're like, well, look, I took care of my business. So, you know, yes, yes. <laughs> and just try to just try to get your buddies to laugh about it. Like I would be so tempted to want to do that all the time, yeah. but you know that it would end up like on first take, probably in the C block being like, is JJ Reddick right to say that he <laughs> locked up his guy mm-hmm. in a 12 point Pelicans loss? So you can't really win, but I would, I would be so uh, tempted to want to do that at least once just to, just I- to screw with all of us. I can give you JJ. Uh, I have like a intricate stat system that I run for myself when I play pickup basketball. And like, if I miss a shot, but my team gets an, uh, gets the rebound, I don't count that as a missed shot for me. So that will then like, that just doesn't count. <laughs> and if I get an offensive rebound, it's like an extra shot that I made. So I can, I'll send you the, the whole thing. Eventually you just come out like having a great game, every game, no matter what. Plus minus. So we, we, talk, we, JJ and I talked about this a bunch. Do you guys think, Corona aside, do you guys think that the media needs to be in the locker room? Mm. Yes. Mm. Yes. 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 I do. Why? I, you know, I'm, I take it from a fan perspective and everything I say is a lot, or at least a lot of times is tongue in cheek. And I don't, uh, you know, we kind of joke about journalism and sports reporters taking things too seriously and like no cheering in the press box. But I do think there's something to be said for guys that are on the beat that are with a team that get the ebbs and flows of a season that you cannot get by just watching the game on TV and not talking to these guys every day. And there's a story to every team, every season that would get missed if you didn't have reporters being able to interact on that level and I think a lot of times it's not like it's not the the press scrum that you're thinking in your mind. It's probably in JJ. You can speak to it. There's probably reporters who know like, hey, I can go up to JJ once a month and get like a good insight on where the team's at and he'll give it to me. Maybe he'll you know speak on the background or whatever. But that job and and having those beat reporters be able to get like the heartbeat of a team, I think is something you cannot get from 10,000 feet. Yeah, I, I think there's a way to get that stuff without actually physically being in the locker room, though. I mean, here, here's the one. But you said thing yes, that, though, right? He he said they should be in the. I, should, I yeah, said they did, should be. Yeah. No, I'm you saying say, I don't think they, they shouldn't. Should. Oh, I don't think okay. they should be. Okay. But, I mean, let me give you an example, like just the most blatant one to me. So, <clears throat> typically, teams have shoot around at home and on on the road. Not every team does. Some teams have completely done away with it. So for the teams that do have it, you have media availability after sh- at before either before or after shoot around. So at 75 or whatever on the clock, on the countdown clock, pregame, there's like a 30-minute window where the media gets to come in the locker room. I don't understand why they're in the locker room during that time. That's the time before the game is the time where I'm like, it's just intrusive. And like I know with Philly and here in New Orleans, there's not a place for us to go, like as players, that is our space. There's not like a player's lounge or something like that. So you're you're like hiding in closets or you're hiding in a bathroom stall or you're just like, where can I go where I can just put my headphones on and not be bothered or read my book or whatever? I don't know. I just think that space pregame is, is that is the most sacred space to me. Post game. Yeah, whatever we can do. We can figure it out, but I was talking pre-game. more post game. So that makes Brian, sense. Yeah, pregame. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's an old timey baseball element to this, you know, where the guys are just around it forever and in the locker room. Um, if I were an athlete, it, it would bother me. You know, Chris Long and I've talked about this a lot. I, I still think it's kind of weird. Like I remember being, and again, I've never been a beat guy. I've, I've never had to do that. I don't envy those guys having to be at the arena, especially in baseball at the stadium every single day. You're talking like seven plus months every day. That's what you're doing. And I was in there a few times just to see what it was like when I was living up in Boston. And it was kind of weird for a radio guy to even be in there at the beginning. But, you know, Veritech, it's pulling down dirty compression shorts, you know, right in front of us, surrounded by 10 people. And I'm like, this is weird. Like, this is weird to me. And, you know, we could get into, you know, violation of like, what should my rights be as a person just because I'm an athlete and you have access to me. But I would fear, 
Like I'm, I'm with you, JJ, that it feels like, especially before tip, like, can we let our minds get right here and just yeah. be about a team and have everybody be out of here? I, I would agree with that. But I think if you were to eliminate it, because I know some people think it's completely unnecessary and I understand like athletes against media. And if I were a player, I probably wouldn't love a lot of the media guys. I don't like a lot of them now and I'm in it. But if you were to say no more access here or to have some neutral room, which we both know, JJ, no players would ever go in the neutral room. <laughs> you know, you just wouldn't go in there. Yeah. I'm afraid that, you know, this is really important. And a lot of people, millions of people care about the outcomes of these games. They care about you as players. Millions of people everywhere that are the reason why everybody makes all this money, or I even make money because people are interested in just people's opinions on it. I'd be afraid that there would be a loss of some connection there if sure. all access were completely eliminated. Sure. I, 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 I think that makes sense. And I would be, I would co-sign the idea that we should not eliminate all access to a locker room. You brought up that Veritech story. That's part of the thing with, uh, with pregame that drives me crazy is so they bring in, especially or for the nationally televised games, you know, the ESPN truck, TNT guys, whatever, those camera guys are in the locker room during this media availability and they're filming you while you're getting yeah. dressed. Now I know, I know they're not going to put that on TV. But there's a fucking B-roll that exists of that. There's people in the truck. Like, uh, why are you filming me putting my tights on? Do you really need to know how I how I tie my shoes? That it that feels a little weird to me. That feels a little weird to me. Don't you think I, there's I a way to? I don't know what the argument against that is. Go ahead, Tommy. Don't you think there's a way to do this? Almost how they do it in like the White House brief, brief, like briefing room, where there are six reporters that are in there, and that's it. You know what I mean? Where it's like. It's, take Chicago, for example, like Casey Johnson. I don't know where he writes now, but he wrote for the Tribune for years. He's clearly a great reporter and is like a resource for Bulls fans. And they want him to have access, not just to the best players in the team, but to the whole team, because he will get information that no one else is getting. So like, I don't think anyone would argue that Casey should be in the locker room. I think the problem is why are there camera guys aside? Why are there 50 people in here that I've never seen before? Uh, right. that you never heard of. I yeah, would also you did say that it. you're eliminating so many other people's access. So then it like puts, puts other yeah. places at a total disadvantage. Like, Oh, Hey, it's been two weeks since I've had locker room access. I don't yeah. know. And the teams right. can ahead. decide and the teams yeah, can then, then yeah. The, this is maybe mix. just a, a, a perception and maybe this is not based on any reality, but it does see, it does feel like after a, a regular season game, that there are way more people now in the locker room than there were, I don't know, like 10 years ago. There are more people, it seems like, that are able to get access. And I don't know if they're You're they're right, by the, the way. I'll just, that. No, I'll just tell you what it is, yeah. is. Is you know, Back in the day, you knew what the two new newspapers were in a major city. You yeah. had probably the place that covered the games and probably some other sports network. You know, I'm thinking Chicago, New York, Boston had two and all those things. But I remember you know, in the times where I would have like the access pass where I would just go to Celtics games and if I didn't have tickets, they would just be like, hey, we got you a media pass. You're going to sit with some scouts or whatever. And then I'd be sitting there like the seven guys that had new Celtics blogs. And you could tell that like this was this thing for them, like, holy shit, I can't believe somebody actually gave me a credential to this. And I think the team was trying to do the right thing. Like they didn't feel like they were discriminating against anybody, but it's so wide now, right? It's so wide of like, what are we supposed to do? And this isn't like an anti-blog thing at all, but it's just a reality of like paying attention to how many different people could make a good argument for print coverage of what was going on and they would have to credential them. So yeah. you're right. There's way more people around it now than ever before. Yeah. And I actually, from my experience, at least in the last you know five or six years, as more and more of this stuff is becoming digital, you have a host of talented people. I mean, the, the, the guys in Philly, specifically uh, uh, Derek, Kyle and, uh, and rich that have been there, you know, throughout the process or whatever, I think they all do excellent work and, you know, they're not, I don't think they're with the Inquirer. I don't think any of them have been with the Inquirer, but they, they all do, they all do great work. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, it's like, and Ryan, I know you talked about this with Bill on the podcast. I listened to the one you guys did right after the NBA season got shut down, but like how challenging is it for you guys right now to come up with sports content? Hmm. 
Uh, it seems like you're getting pretty creative, Big Cat. Yeah, I mean, this I is... I know you were live tweeting uh, the Duke's win over Wisconsin <laughs> yes. the other night. Yeah, and I got an In the 2015 league. game. Yeah, that, that sucked. I don't know why I did that. Um, by the way, the last point on the, on the entire locker room thing, I'm going to change my answer to no, they shouldn't have access. I didn't realize how many cameras are in there. And as someone who has like an incredibly small penis, that would suck for myself. So I, I like, I'm getting, I'm getting scared just thinking about it. Like if I ever go pro, I don't want that. So I'll, I'll say no, no one in the locker room ever. Okay. But to answer your question about the content, um, I actually, it, it's weird because obviously I miss sports and I want sports to be here because I love watching sports, but yeah, I do think this is a weird spot in time where the more creative people can flourish a little. I mean, we we just do things differently where uh, I think if we were a lot more straightforward X's and O's, it'd be a lot more difficult. But right now, you know, we can just talk about whatever and, and find anything to talk about. And we also, if all else fails, we can just wait for the media to start talking about something and then just make fun of them. So that kind of is a, a fail safe for us at all times. Also, you guys are used to you being Barstool. You guys are used to being remote. Yeah, they, no, this is definitely a weird, I, I've joked about it, but we have gone back in time because there were five, six years there where I would sit in my apartment in Chicago and blog all day long and just, it was just me and my dog. And so now I feel like we're back in time where it's like, I know how to do this because I did this for so long that it doesn't feel weird at all. And it's almost like, you know, riding a bike again, where you're just like, okay, now I know what to do. Like, you just got to find ways to make new content. I mean, I run a, an illegal horse race out of my, my living room every single night and people love it. So you just find different ways to make it work. I'm not afraid of this. Uh, I guess we'd rather have games on, but if there's one thing I learned from the radio show over the years is I could break down everything. Like I mapped out on Mike and Mike, how the Warriors were going to get Kevin Durant. Okay. I said, this is what they're going to do. Here's how Dallas is going to come into play. They're going to bounce Harrison Barnes. They've worked this out with Bogut. Here's all the different movies. Like I had it line by line, everything they were going to do before they did it. And one of the biggest segments I've ever done at ESPN is could you beat up a wolf if you had a catcher's mask and protector on? So mm -hmm. if you're just good at doing the job, which I'd like to think, <laughs> you know, a few of us are at this point, yeah. if people oddly just kind of want to hear you talk about stuff. Um, you can't mail it in. You know, I still prep the same way I'd prep before, but I've just, you know, whether it's the redrafts or I'm doing some different interviews with different people that are successful from, from other walks of life, but I'm not... I prefer games, but I'm not worried uh, months of this because I just think that it's something when you're doing radio every single day for three, this 15 hours a week for 10 years, I'm doing a radio show. I can handle a couple hour podcast a week, so I'll figure it out. Yeah. And it's to go off what Ryan's saying. I, I think the, the bigger point is like, if you have spent years cultivating an audience uh, that is interested in just kind of hanging out with you, that's what it ends up being like, it's right. almost like, Hey, there's no sports on, but we're going to hang out and we'll talk about whatever. But the people who have done a good job of creating an audience, creating a fan base, I think they will be fine because they can do it during any time. What's your feeling on the, uh, Instagram live boom. I didn't know there was a boom. Shit. Oh, are you kidding? DJs. This Everybody. is like the big Everybody. D nice. Oh, D nice. I didn't notice that. But it's not just DJs. It's, it's not just DJs though. It's everybody's going live on everything now. Tiger King. It's the every 10 seconds. But, so my thing, I'll tell you what, what I like to do is I like to, uh, coworkers that might not have a huge following. Like for example, there's this one guy who doesn't even, he's not an on camera guy. He's behind the camera guy. And, uh, he likes to sing karaoke and he does like karaoke once a week on Periscope, I like to find those and try to boost it to like an insane number just to watch them be like, Oh shit. Now people are watching. So I think I'm going to start doing that with like random people, try to find kids with like five people watching and retweet it and see like, let's get this going. Let's find some, 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 uh, diamonds in the rough when it comes to everyone going live. Wow. You're a real influencers influencer. In yeah, exactly. I I'm a behind the scenes influencer. Pretty heroic. I'm always amazed though at how <laughs> I would say so how few people actually watch Instagram live at yeah. any given time. I mean, you go at like Dame Lillard was doing it last night, and I went on for like five seconds, and it was like nine hundred people watching him. Ooh, shots how about fired! When Steph and, and Dr. Fauci did it, there was fifty thousand. 
They announced ahead of time they were going to do this. That's not a big number. You know who the only person who does well on Instagram Live is? Is Cardi B. Mm. Cardi B does consistent 150, 160, doing nothing, just talking. No, no Fauci conversation, no anything. Just her talk shit will get that much. Well, you got to be more like Cardi B, apparently. Yeah. Tommy, yep. did you did you watch any of Talib Kweli's set the other day that he was playing? I watched a little bit of it. Yeah, yeah. it was good. It's pretty good. D nice, D nice. Last week was great. That was it, unbelievable because it was, unbelievable. it was kind of the beginning. And D nice, if anybody remembers, like this is I'm going to date myself here, but my name is D nice T R eight oh eight. That was one of my all time favorite cassette tapes. When I first heard my name is D nice, I went out immediately. Strawberries, what's up? bought the tape, lay up lines, backyard to D-Nice constantly. And then I got to meet him because now he's like this famous DJ who DJs for the Obamas when they're in office on Martha's Vineyard. And he's every big event, all the ESPN parties, Super Bowl stuff. He got me into one of Rick Ross's shows. He couldn't be nicer. And he had almost, I think, peak 100,000. And he just did a set. I think, Tommy, what was it? Like eight, 10 hours it was, straight? That's just it flipping was. it up? The attrition, right. the attrition of it was what made it so impressive. He did it for three days straight, probably noon noon to midnight and he's and such just, a nice guy too yeah you know? and that's just the amount wow. of the amount of music you have to know to do that is just you can't you can't luck your way into it that's no, just a no. it's just as yeah but there's but the new thing with the djs now is the battle so like manny fresh and scott storch did it uh a couple of days ago but all these producers are just getting on there and they're basically just playing their catalogs and people are just getting in the comments and just like gassing them up Tommy, what can you tell me about this young chop guy though? Because he, he seems to be taking the Instagram live to another level. I don't Are know. You up on this? I don't know enough about it to comment. I feel I right. feel like I I feel like I don't want to misrepresent it. And so, but it, but it definitely is a thing. It's that okay. it's hard though. It's hard though. It's every it's you you get off the internet for three hours and there's and there's something new. Have you guys done any uh, push up challenges or anything like that? Mm. Any challenges? No. No. Taylor Twelman challenged me, but I don't really like him, so I didn't do it. <laughs> I think we should get into the power rankings. I, I just want to be, yeah. be clear about we we talked about the power rankings ahead of time, correct? We're all we're all in agreement on what this power ranking is going to be. It's a draft, right? Or is it a power rankings? It's the power. Or is it the Mount the Rushmore. Five, the five people you okay. guys do Mount Rushmore. You are right. Yeah. It's just we're the five stealing, people. But let's be clear: we are not stealing another podcast bit. We Which, by the way, I love when people, I, I mean, I love when people are like, hey, man, they stole Mount Rushmore. It's like, but, but <laughs> like the reason we started doing it was because it was everyone did it. They're right. Yeah, it's, <laughs> making, it. yeah. it's making fun of Mount <laughs> Rushmore. Right. But it's, it is a credit to your success that there's so many younger guys. Like anytime like people were doing Mount Rushmore's in July while right. they were fixing baseball on Sports Talk Radio in like 2005. I know. But your audience is so young. <laughs> that if anybody says Mount Rushmore, and again, it's, it's a credit to you guys. It's like, oh, you guys are stealing that from people. Yeah. Like, you guys don't even understand that they're making fun of the fact that everybody did it. Right, but, uh, right. Anyway. <laughs> so, yeah, please don't do Mount Rushmore. All right. <laughs> the, it, it's the five people that you would most like to be quarantined with, correct? Five, five TV characters. Five, mm-hmm. tele, five television Five TV char- characters. Yes, five television yes. oh, I really characters. tricked this one off. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, okay, you're uh, up right. first. Wait, wait. So is it a draft or are we doing our five? We're doing you're five. You're doing your five. No rankings. Oh, we're not drafting. N- no. No, no, no. Oh. You're ranking them. Oh. Yeah, I you're thought we're drafting them. and like if someone takes someone, then it's off the board. No. Actually, well, drafting is it, like I we only do drafting on the Ryan Rosillo podcast because I invented it. So <laughs> I think we I mean, should draft. I mean, let's draft. Fine. I'm down. <laughs> yeah, that's the only draft. way to do this. Yeah, let's yeah. draft. You. All right, you're up first. Are we no, snaking? you go first, Tommy. Yeah, yeah, oh. well, Snake Draft. You go first, Tommy. Okay. Yeah, I like this. All right, um, all right, so you can't pick. You cannot pick a redundant pick because that makes it more interesting. Otherwise, it's just yes. like, here's my list of guys yes. or girls. We should do this from now on because Sexist. JJ steals my shit half the time. Are you, so you guys just didn't realize that you could draft when you no, pick random didn't. things. we didn't. We Got never it. heard of that This before. is innovation on the JJ I'm, Reddick I'm featuring never Tommy to the, Alter podcast. I've never listened to either of your podcasts, so I would not know. <laughs> All right, first pick, uh, Polly Walnuts. Ooh. Sopranos. Okay. So um, I, had, I needed a Sopranos character. Okay. I actually thought about, I, I, I wrote down like some of my favorite shows and some of the characters on there. 
Yeah. I put down Polly Walnuts. I think Polly Walnuts would get super annoying. Here's he, my, like, remember the boat scene when Tony almost wanted to kill him just because he was fucking annoying? He would certainly get annoying. No disagreement. He's an insanely gifted cook. You need some cook. Mo- yes. You- yeah. Yeah. I got you there. I just I would be so annoyed by him after like two weeks because he and he he also I mean. I feel like Paul Walnuts would try to be the alpha at all times. He would. I mean, it's, I'm going to have to build the rest of this house out carefully. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's such a bad pick. I don't even know where to start. Number one overall. <laughs> I mean, you picked, you picked an wait, insanely no, no. annoying wait, guy is- who isn't that smart. I mean, this is, this is like Anthony Bennett's <laughs> younger brother going number one. It's not even Anthony Bennett. I mean, uh, this is un. I, okay. I can't believe that was the number one pick. <laughs> that was like I was uh, I, right. I sugarcoated that it was a bad pick, and then right. Russell just came over the top right, and was like, up. "Hit you with the steel chair." Yeah, let's hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> we do okay. this for a living, Tommy. I don't think you understand. <laughs> You're walking into the Tigers' let's, den. Let's R- hear Ryan it. and I draft random things for a living. Hear it. Okay. Um. You know. Look, I, I'm, I'm going to play it out long. You're right. You're going to build a house the right way. Every character's going to play off each other. But I always admire John Locke's. Uh, just ingenuity on lost. I mean, if something goes down, he's going to be able to fix a power breaker. He's going to be able to fix your dishwasher. He's going to make sure the railings are still up to code. And I thought he was a pleasant guy because, you know, he had some real medical scares there. So he was kind of looking at life positively the rest of the way. So I need somebody positive. I need somebody who can fix a fridge. So I'm going John Locke with my number one pick. Okay. Good pick. I'll, should I go three? And then J- JJ, you'll get two in a row. Cause we're going to snake draft it. Yeah, um, okay. I was in the same mindset as you, Ryan, on my first pick. I want someone that can basically, you know, if this turns into an apocalypse situation, if this turns into six months of of doing this, I need someone who can who can help keep everything together. Yeah, so like I'm going to go with Ron, Ron Swanson is my number one pick. The guy can build stuff. He's, uh, you know, if we have to go into the woods, he's going to help us there. Uh, he also is a classic, like, the roommate that just like leave him alone and he'll leave you alone kind of situation. So he's not going to get your business. You're not going to get in his, but if, if shit really goes down, he's someone you can trust a boy scout. If so you will, you'd really want to be, you always a, need that. You'd really want to be in a house with Ron Swanson for four months. Yes, I, I, I would need, you need that guy. I, I actually call them. Uh, it's uh, like, everyone has that friend who can, who can tie a, a sick knot, like, you know, like the boat friend who can be like, all right, I, I got too. this. Like yeah. I can, it, like you need one of those guys, and Ron Swanson is that guy. Like I can tie like nine different. I do agree. Knots. You need that friend. I just don't know you want to be living with that friend. But okay. Listen, you're upset because <laughs> Ryan shit down yeah. your throat. That's what this is about. I don't. I don't <laughs> that's what this I don't is about. I don't take my pick back <laughs> at all. I don't take my pick back I'm at all. Not, it, was not, a, not, it was a very strong first pick. <laughs> <laughs> I make no apologies for Paulie. I think your reasoning doesn't make any sense. I, I always shit on your picks, but whatever. Uh, I'm kind of having to go on the fly here because, um, cause I, I totally, I totally did this wrong. Uh, my five people were all real an extension. <laughs> we're all real people. So I'm just going to say, Hey, all right, I'm going. So first pick, uh, because I get two, I'm looking for someone resourceful. So that'll be my second pick. Uh, first pick is, uh, Don Draper. Mm. And the reason is I, uh, my wife goes to bed super early, usually around like seven thirty, eight o'clock. And I would, I would love to have like a drinking buddy. I think it'd be great. Just ab- even worse than Tommy's pick. <laughs> Draper's off my board, red flags <laughs> everywhere. Yes. yes he's going to be able to, he'll drink with you whenever you want. That part's great, but he's probably going to leave and not tell you what's going on. And that whole part about the wife, no offense. He's going to sleep with her. He's going to sleep with your wife at some point. He's going to sleep with your sister. She visits. He'll he'll take your mom down if he's had a little bit too much <laughs> bourbon that night. So Don Draper is a do not draft flags everywhere guy for Agreed. me. Agreed you, you're that. like the Raiders. You're like Al Davis Again, Raiders. I, just I'm doing this love. on the fly. My, my first pick in real life IRL was going to be uh, my trainer. So. I went from my trainer to that's a Draper. <laughs> so JJ, yeah, you missed you missed the so uh, going, text I'm chain. Going. Yeah, you missed the text chain when I said we were like, hey, let's do a, a draft of five people you could quarantine with, and I was like, let's do yeah. TV characters. So when we say like, hey, yeah. my buddy, my buddy Bob, I want to <laughs> be with him. People would be like, who cares, Big Cat? Well, I was going to do the people. This I, is the funniest part. I, I, I can't think of a worse idea than drafting five real people. <laughs> 
five people drafted. nobody knows. Yeah. yeah. Well, they, they were all people other than my trainer. You know, my my uh, my aunt Sarah, all, she cooked some great no, we cookies. And I was were like, be you out. know, I really, were be I really out. That's like where that I was, hot roast on day <laughs> four <laughs> of the quarantine. All right. <laughs> second. <laughs> yeah, so my, my next pick, my next pick is MacGyver. <laughs> MacGyver. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just need someone. I've never seen MacGyver. You've never seen MacGyver? Well, I've never seen no. Sopranos, so. Mm. Okay. I think you've got something to do over the next three months. All right. Sopranos. Good pick. Yeah, All right. Sopranos. My, my next pick is going to be um, probably not a lot of people remember this show, but it did have four seasons, so I think it still plays. Um, it was late 90s. I'm going to take, uh, you know him as Coach Taylor, but he was Gary Hobson from early edition. And the premise of the show was a cat would come to his door every morning and give him the Chicago Sun Times a day before it happens. So now I have Ron Swanson and I have Gary Hobson, who now we get tomorrow's paper today and we will know when shit really hits the fan and also maybe make some money on the stock market. Really important things to have somebody get the paper in uh, 2020. I mean, listen, do you not want the paper for tomorrow? Tommy's still mad. Tommy's still mad. He's still so mad. He's still so mad. (laughs) I mean, Pauly Walnuts. Like when the the, the fourth time that Pauly Walnuts repeats my funny joke back to me, I'm going to fucking snap. Right. And you know, Pauly Walnuts is going to do shit like put mayo on cereal. They'd be like, hey, Tommy, we're out of mayo. And you'd be like, well, because you're putting it on cornflakes. Pauly, be like, hey, yeah, that's the way I like it. Um, I, no way. Sorry. I still can't get over it. All right. So MacGyver's a good pick. I feel like I went with a humble MacGyver because, you know, I don't want MacGyver like showing off and be like, look, dude, you know, it's been a while, but I, I think it's a good pick. What was your guy's pick again? Big cat. What's his name? Uh, Gary Hobson. It's coach Taylor from Friday okay. Night lights, but he was in early edition was the show early edition. Okay, great. I'm going to go with Tony Danza's character, Tony. And who's the boss <laughs> teach you a little boxing, a little <laughs> fitness, clean up after us done. Like it. Nice. All right. Tony Danza's character was named Tony. Nice. <laughs> Pretty simple. My second. Don't have to get that confused. My second pick. Um, I'm going with Gus from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Uh, what? Very, <laughs> very clean. Very neat. <laughs> protection. <laughs> hey, hold on one second. Hold on one second. What? If somebody if, if somebody tries to break into the house, he's going to handle it. Um, he also can cook. Um, I think he'd be a good housemate. <laughs> okay, you know what? I'm going to back Tommy up a little bit here, though. At first, I'm like, "What are we doing?" But <laughs> I did think about badass characters that if stuff gets real weird, if shit goes and, down. And right. You need someone yeah. who can handle themselves. Yeah, and yeah. and Gus and Gus isn't like a goon. Like he's not going to be annoying to be with. I have Paulie there to be the muscle. Gus is just there to just make sure that everything is handled. And okay. Do it super, super neat, super. Uh, I, okay. I just feel like you would, you would like get caught in like you're down, you come down one morning and it's you and Gus just sitting there at, at, at the, at the kitchen table eating breakfast. And there's a long silence that go, comes over the conversation. You're like, well, you, are you thinking about killing me right now? No, but he's looking at me about to murder would, me. That I, that would get with me. That would get in my head. I would have to do something. I would have to betray him in some way for him to kill me. And I'm not going to betray him. I actually think we would get along great. Like, you know, the three of you, you though, like think about this right now. Like you're around a lot of celebrities, Tommy, more than any of us, probably even more than JJ. So you know how to hang in the background a little bit, but you yeah. just picked a drug Lord and a mafioso <laughs> captain. Like those are your and first oh, two wait, guys. Wait, wait, like, wait, you you got to worry about balance, man. Here's my oh, here's my, my here's my question though. I'm oh. worried. I'm worried about Gus and Paulie getting along. Yeah, yeah. I'm that's, not sure. that's one house. I'm not that's sure. I'm not sure that would work. But that's not Paul, what's the my, square footage. That's not my problem. Paulie, I don't know if you if you if where you are, remember the on this, by the way. Where are we? Uh, Tommy, just, just, Tommy just took a drug lord. I just picked yeah. Gus <laughs> from Breaking Bad. Tommy has Tommy has an Italian mafioso who doesn't really play well with other uh, criminals that might be minorities, and then he picked a drug lord uh, that that guy is probably going to hate, and then they're going to yeah. kill each other. All right, so I'm, I'm number three. I'm up again. Tommy has uh, no one in his house right now. Little, I'm throwing a little wrench into this. Number three, I'm going with uh, Nathan Fielder from Nathan for You. Oh, for some okay. comic, for some comic relief. Yep, 
best pick so far for you. That's Gang, a good you know, pick, Tommy. We needed a, if you had done a third alpha for your third <laughs> first three picks, I'm like, so you guys, that's toast. Um, I like you that. You've been pick. like Rob Stark. <laughs> the mountain. <laughs> I'm like, I want somebody else who may kill me in my sleep. <laughs> Okay, oh, I like that. Oh, I just got a big alpha <laughs> house. What can I say? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna do, go ahead and um um touch on the the one thing that we're probably all trying to avoid is how do we mix this up with the female characters? Oh, I have you know, mine. Oh, I, who's I, gonna I, be, I, I have mine. mine. It's coming. I got mine. Right, who's gonna be creepy? Who's not gonna be creepy? How is she gonna vibe with everybody else? Is there a chance she'll like me? You know, we are in quarantine. There aren't a ton of options. So I'm just going to go with my number one. Jamie Presley is Joy Turner. My name is Earl. And, you know, look, she can, she can, she's low maintenance. She's high maintenance, low maintenance, but it's not like she's an aristocrat, right? A little bit of trailer background there. So I may seem real, real obtainable there after like 90, 120 days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like right. that. That's good. And the other, and, the other t- and, and as of right now, it's John Locke. And Tony Danza, and they're so much older than me. Yeah, that's true. You're the young stallion. <laughs> young bull. <laughs> um, okay, so going off that, so I uh, was thinking about that as well. I have a couple of female uh, characters that I, I have circled, and I'll go with my first pick of that, uh, Pam Beasley. I think Pam is so misunderstood in the office, and she is one of my favorite characters. And like, she's just sweet and kind-hearted, and hold on, I can't see Ryan's <laughs> face right now. Is he getting upset? <laughs> okay, no, my real tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, she'll she'll just steal from the house. She'll quit and then ask if she can come back. And she'll tell everybody else in the house to not have any goals, uh, but support her and her doodling. I, yep, I love it. teeing Ryan up to get mad about Pam. Um, you you sound like uh, you should be like on an incel Reddit when you get mad about Pam. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's bad. It's awesome. All right, my next pick. This one's going to be a little controversial, but I'm going to explain it first. Um, so I think whenever you're in a group for a long time, you know, there's always the group hierarchy. There's always the who's the butt of the joke, who's the guy that can take it the most. And if you have a house full of uh, criminals like Gus and, and Polly, people are probably going to be yelling at each other. There's no one they can make fun of. So I'm taking the guy who can take the joke, butt of the joke, uh, in Charlie Kelly from Always Sunny. Wild card, and he is the he he. You know exactly where he is in the hierarchy. He can laugh at himself. He can be laughed at. Like he's he's not going to be upset about it. If if you know he is the butt of the joke, he's not going to sweet d it. So Charlie Kelly, a little messy. That's the only downside. I think the mess is probably going to be a problem, but we'll maybe put him in the basement. But Charlie Kelly's my next. Pick. So, what, what's your house right now? My house right now is Ron Swanson, oh. Gary Hobson, which I feel like that was a bad pick because no one even knows the show. <laughs> but the, I do the, get the newspaper the before newspaper everyone else. I mean, that's I'm picking him for the cat. Yeah, that's um, cool. You can look at stock tips when the market is going to be disgusting. Uh, it's called shorting the market, Ryan. Uh, I don't even know what that means. Uh, <laughs> and then Charlie Kelly. That sounded convincing. <laughs> All right, JJ. You got two. All right. I'm, all right. Two, two again? Yep. JJ's dog Stake walker? It. Snake. Snake. All, right. <laughs> all right. So, Ted. Fuck, man. Ted from Florida. <laughs> I have so far. Yeah. I've got Don my Draper masseuse. and MacGyver. <laughs> and my chef. <laughs> my chef. <laughs> my trainer. Walker. All right. Well, I need a chef in the there. So I'm going gonna, gonna to go, and, I, and, and obviously a female, but you know what? This is not, this is a purely Sexist. platonic thing. Um, but I'm, oh, okay. I'm going to go with Monica from Friends. She was a chef, um, mm. worked at a fancy Italian restaurant. Um, and then I just like her vibe too. I like that pick. Yeah. Thanks, man. And then I'm going to go with um, uh, just someone to play like competitive Fisher Price uh, shooting games with. So I'm going to go with Nathan Scott from One Tree Hill. <laughs> Mm. Wow, deep cut. <laughs> that wow. is a deep cut. Okay. What's the Fisher Price part of this? Are those the only games you're going to be into at this point, or what? No, I'm just what need, I need about? like some level of like competition, you know. So I'm just thinking about my actual house that I'm quarantined in, and there's a there, there there's a, my kids have a Fisher Price hoop in the basement. So 
Ah, Fisher Price. Yeah. Got it. Got, Got it. it. What, uh, which teammates, just to j- interject here real quick, give me your top Pelicans teammate to be quarantined with and the one you would dread it the most. The one that I would, um, whew, the, 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 the guy I would like to be quarantined with the most would probably be, um, I'd probably say, probably say Franklin, Franklin Jackson. He's a, uh, he's a funny guy. And they, they're going off that JJ now do uh rank one to 10, the teammates you would uh, least want to be quarantined with using the 2016, 17 uh, LA Clippers roster. <laughs> <laughs> a hard pass on that one. I love those guys, man. What are you talking? I love those guys. My next pick. Um, so, I agree, Ryan, what you were saying. We need, you know, you need the female to, to have it, not just, just be, things are better. Right. You know, when we used to have like, when we were counting on our tips back in the old bartending days, if, if some girls decided to sip and not even like in a weird way, but we just, it was more fun. It gets weird when it's just guys the whole time. It sucks. When it's just guys, it becomes like everyone just becomes a caveman after like day three. It's, it's basically yeah. the rule of bachelor yeah. parties. You can't do a bachelor party more than, than two days, really. Cause on the third day, everyone kind of loses their mind, especially when it's Ron Swanson and the guy from Always Sunny in your house. Again, this is Paulie Walnuts uh, <laughs> hate coming out. Yeah. All right, so my pick, and this is, so with the way everything's going right now, I'm a big believer in like optimism is great. We want hope. We hope that everything's going to get back to normal soon enough. But there's also a level of like, no one wants to be around the optimistic person all the time. There needs to be some reality in there. So I'm going to take uh, April Ludgate because she will not be like, hey guys, I think this is going to end soon. She's going to tell you exactly how it is. Uh, and this is from Parks and Rec, and basically just be a downer all the time, which you kind of need a little bit of that because guess what? We're quarantining together. We're not going to Cabo. I feel like you really like she that might show. Be too much of a. There's a yeah, lot of Parks and too Rec. Much of a downer, though. That was two Parks and Recs. I agree. I, um, I think it's a little weird to have uh, two people from the same show on this, but that's just me. Ryan, you're well, up. they know each other. Ryan, you're up. <laughs> Wow, just a, just a drive by swipe post yeah, he's, Walnuts. He's pick really yeah. he's, he's, he's really okay. I, I have a lot of things here on the board. I, I think anyone from Oz Shield, Deadwood, are probably out. Schillinger be a bad pick. Uh, I thought about jo- I, I've thought about jovial heavy guy because jovial heavy guys are always kind of important, but a lot of them are kind of the same. You know, whether you go Mike and Molly, King of Queens, you go maybe Daryl from The Office. Um, I even thought about House in case we had a medical emergency, but he's just too alpha as it is. And, you know, he wasn't super agreeable. So you got to worry about that. But you're right. Like, I kind of like where you're going there. Not always, I don't want a room full of optimists. I thought about Job perhaps to do some magic, but I think the magic plus side of it would ruin his plus minus with all the negatives on the other deal. Um, so I'm going to go with uh, Paperboy from Atlanta because you know, maybe he and I could. Just start doing some beats together live from a laptop. We'd have a hobby. And, you know, I don't think he's, I think he's very much the same. You know, he could get heated every now and then. But Tommy, you see, like, I feel like I'm getting an eye roll out of you. I just think I know what I'm getting there. It doesn't seem like that fun of a hang. For two days, maybe three months. Hmm. Fair, fair. I don't, I, you know, I can't really counter that. But uh, I like it though. I just, I just, I just need somebody in the mix that I'm not expecting much from. It would be, it would be fun to be quarantined with someone who's recording. Something yeah, to do. Go. Good. Yeah, something they can do from home. Yeah, yeah. instead of just yeah. a, a meth dealer and a guy who runs. No, but I have to say, I'm really, I'm really impressed with the amount of thought that you put into this, and I can see from you. Uh, you know, maneuvering in the foreground that you're, you're definitely have, uh, you know, you definitely have a draft board and I, I, yeah, because I, I thought Bruce Lee was eligible as Cato. Right. And so I'm like, do I need him there? But if you know anything about Bruce Lee, as I do, he's really fucking annoying at times, even though he invented smoothies, right? (laughs) Like he was the first guy putting oats and peanut butter and all sorts of vitamins and just blending it up and having people drink it. But, you know, after day four of him talking about the light and the push and all this stuff, I just, that's why I went with Tony Danza, because he's going to clean up after us. So thank you. Thank you, JJ. I appreciate that. Yeah. I see it. Always been a team. All right, whose turn is it? I got, I got two. Um, 
Lila Garrity, Friday Night Lights. Need to mix it up a little bit. I think she'd be fun to hang around for a couple months. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was like, there wasn't a ton of depth to that one. No, <laughs> he's just trying to get in and out because he knows that we're just like hovering around his picks. <laughs> and then my, my last pick, my last pick, which I thought a lot about, I think this might be a little of a little bit of a weird one. Um, and it is, it's another alpha to the mix. So I'm not sure how the fit would be, but Bobby Axelrod from Billions, because we could stay at his house in the Hamptons. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm. I like that. That's that ridiculous practical. house. So that way, all of my people who may or may not get along with each other, they all could be in different wings of the house and they never have to see. You. That's practical. So you just... Yeah, once you added the real estate element to this, you changed the entire game. Yeah. But so far, right now, everybody's in my house. It's not very big. Especially now that you got a gym in your living room. <laughs> 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 I don't know. JJ, Axelrod, examine this one for me here. Because I, I don't, I just feel like he's, <sighs> he's got these kingpin types. I was, trying, your house I was trying to gonna... figure out what TV character has a great wine collection. That's really what I was trying to figure out. And there's a good chance that Bobby Axelrod has a really great wine cellar in his Hamptons house. Yep. There's a, there's a solid chance there. There's no debate. Yep. So I think, no debate. I think it's a solid choice. I think it's one of your better choices, actually. I think it's in the middle. I think all my choices are pretty good. Yeah. All right. Who's okay, up? Ryan. Hey, Big Cat, Dr. Doctor Who's still available, Big Cat. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, you got your last pick? Yeah. Um, I thought maybe Selena Myers, she'd have good stories. She was the president. And I've always liked her, but she without a the staff president. around her. I f- yeah. I mean, I feel like we'd all end up being her staff because she's not used to kind of being on her own. So I threw that one out. Um, this really comes down to two right now. Steve Sanders... From 90210. Because he'd just be down to try to find something fun. Mm -hmm. Or do I go with a pet? I'm going to go Brian the dog from Family Guy. He's a writer. We could give each other notes. You know, he doesn't, he's not afraid of a late night. He just, he's in the mix and he's still a dog. So, you know, that's a good, it's a good pick. Okay. Okay. Uh, Yeah, that is a good pick. I'm so. You pass on Selena Myers. I'm actually, my fifth pick is going to be Elaine Bennis because I think she's just it's a great hang and the perfect, yep. perfect throw in there where it's like, now you got three guys, well, four, including me and two and two girls. So there's a good ratio at all times. And, uh, I don't, I don't know how you could go wrong. She can, she can hang out with all these people. She can bust balls with all these people. That's my last pick. She probably should have been a first rounder, honestly, because she's seriously for her to be able to hang with that crew for that many years. And I loved her the entire show. um, She should have been a first round pick. Great value there in the fifth round. Great value. Um, I feel most confident about this, this final pick. Uh, And I, once you figured out the rules, well, yeah, but I also, this solves my Don Draper issue. And Don Draper and my wife. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, this person in her like description of her character, it says she doesn't Power run cooking. from crisis, she, but toward mm. it. So this is the perfect time for her to come in. She's going to help solve problems. She's going to be super informed and chances are she's going to take Don Draper, you know, his attention. And that's Olivia Pope. Yes. Olivia Pope from scandal. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> A good pick. I don't hate it. It's a I good like pick. that. I, not a lot of reaction. Very yeah, not a lot of reaction. Very practical. I don't know if it solves the Don Draper problem, though. Do you know what would have <laughs> solved the Don Draper problem? If you had picked... Nothing <laughs> solved No. It. Hold on. Hear me out. You could have gone with Cersei, and Don Draper like would have mm. been going after Cersei the whole time, and the unattainable... Uh, like lay there, because Cersei's like, hey, I'm not related to you. I don't want to fuck you. And so they never end up having sex. And Don Draper just spends his entire quarantine chasing after Cersei. Mm. She, By the way, you know why it's a good pick? Because I go ahead, JJ, and I'll jump in. Oh, there. no, no, no. It's fine. Go ahead. The reason why it's uh, we should have gotten more reaction out of that. She's going to have White House connections. 
She's going to know what what's saying. going She's on. Informed. Boots on the ground. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No. So that's yeah. that actually might be the biggest asset out of the entire class that we just drafted there because she's just going to know she's going to be able like it's not going to be hey my cousin who works at the pentagon text like we all got there for a couple yeah. of weeks it's going to be real white house stuff like, if there yeah. if there ends up being martial law she will know ahead of time she will know ahead of time yep get your machetes well, i have the i have the newspaper but whatever <laughs> redundant <laughs> it didn't go over well. I mean, I, I have the tabby feel, cat that's giving I me do feel like there's going to be like a, more of like a 48 hours to 72 hours sort of heads up, you know? Oh, okay. Um, I literally have the newspaper. Yeah. The newspaper I know exactly important. what's happened. It's, it's kind of like in Contagion when Lawrence Fishburne's character gets in trouble for warning uh, his, his spoiler. His <laughs> yeah, come on, man. <laughs> Some of us are saving that for month two. <laughs> I uh, I tried to watch, so I watched uh, World War Z. Um, then the next night I watched Contagion, and then the third night I tried to watch Outbreak. And mm. holy fuck, that movie's terrible! I couldn't get through the first twenty minutes. Outbreaks, Outbreaks, a tough one. You know, you know what I love about this whole thing is that Big Cat was like, "I'm going to blow these guys' I, minds." I did when I take the guy. From the yeah. newspaper show, it sucks because it's no like, one knows. It was a great show. <laughs> it was a great no show. No one cares. And it might be the smartest pick, but no one you cares. You literally get the news tomorrow, today. It's it's a great show. It's a cat. It's a fucking fat orange think, cat that brings think, it to him. I don't think anyone's ever heard of the show, much less seen it. Yeah, I guess I don't know. Late Who has, does anyone yeah, have a I pick guess. left? Do we, does anyone have a pick left? No, that was no, it. That was, that was it, it, man. All right. Yeah. The guy I would have taken from Sopranos is I, I I was thinking about this, Tommy. I would have taken Silvio because he's kind of just minds his own business, loyal, not gonna like, you know, you know, get You're, anyone in a fight or anything. That that would have been my pick from the Sopranos. Okay. The cooking is important. What? You're underestimating the cooking. Mm -hmm. Like Paul Silvio can cook, can he? No, Silvio just stands in the corner. Paul is not a fun hang. But we we're gonna be eating good. Like that's well, what we good. Yeah. You picked him first. You just <laughs> said he's not a fun hang, and you picked him first. I also would have. I also had on my board uh, that I didn't pull the trigger on. But Greg the Egg would have been a good pick too, because he's another one like the Charlie Kelly role, where it's like you can he can kind of be the guy that everyone busts his balls, and you don't have that tension build up inside the quarantine. Yeah, I don't have him in enough people here I can make fun of. That's if I problem. make fun of John Locke. John Locke's going to go, okay, cool. Do you guys want running water? Yeah. Done. Um, Every crew needs a Tommy. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> what is what is Zing on the way out? Holy that was, shit. All right. That was rough. <laughs> By the way, I figured out my internet issue um, when I left uh, for like 10 minutes. So basically... Uh, the bandwidth out here just is awful. And uh, I can only have like one device connected at a time. So my kids came back in the house, got on their iPads. And that's why I lost you for a few minutes. So thanks for hanging with me. All right, uh, Ryan, Big Cat, thank you guys. Appreciate the time. You guys have been a lot of fun. We're going to um, probably have to edit some of the stuff out. Um, multiple references to male genitalia that won't, won't be on the final cut of the show. <laughs> No, you can keep in that I have a small dick. Everyone knows that. I'm leaving that part in. Yeah, we're All definitely right. keep, we're, we're keeping that for sure. We're definitely keeping that part. <laughs> we're actually going right. to put it at the front. <laughs> <laughs>